welcome Omi Sade and thank you for joining us. Omi Sade is a seventh generation North Carolinian and she has spent the better part of the last 25 years focused on the liberation of marginalized people. She is the creator and curator of the Black Girl's Guide to Surviving Menopause, which we're going to hear about shortly, um, and is just an incredible activist and um, brings some amazing energy to this space. We're really fortunate to have her. Um, and Dr. Duke, who is a Johns Hopkins and Yale trained physician, scientist, and entrepreneur. Um, she's board certified in gynecology, endocrinology, and infertility, so REI. Um, and she's a physician founder, medical and lab director of the Nevada Fertility Institute in Vegas. So welcome to you both. Thank you for joining us. And I'm excited to kick off the conversation. I'm going to pull down our slides so we can kind of look at each other and folks can feel free to unmute themselves with questions at any time or put them in the chat. If you'd prefer to do so anonymously, we're gonna carve out some time um, for questions towards the end. Um, I also want to give a, a shout out to, I think we're, we've got some black turtlenecks um, <laughs> on the screen, <laughs> mind meld. I but, just noticed that. I was like, did everybody get the memo? <laughs> right. Yeah. I didn't uh, get the turtleneck one, but I wore black. You did get black. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> We're, um, we're a stylish bunch today. But my, um, my fabulous co-founder at Electra Health, Alessandra Henderson, is also with us, so I want to give a shout out to her as well. So to kick off, I have a few questions prepared, but again, feel free to raise your hands, unmute, ask questions, put them in the chat. We'll save some time afterwards, and we'll follow up with any resources and a recording um, by email after the event. So I think just to kick off, would love to know from, from Dr. Duke, what do you see um, in your practice day to day caring for women who are on the perimenopause and menopause journey? What sort of facts um, do you think we need to be equipped with as we're reaching this phase of life? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm so happy to be here today and to share this platform with Omi Sade. Um, I think, you know, the key thing I want everyone to know is Generation X is firmly in menopause. And even the Xennials are entering menopause or in perimenopause at this time. And so I would say at least 15% of my patients who come through the clinic seeking fertility services are either perimenopausal or already have gone through menopause and of course we define menopause as having the absence of periods for at least 12 consecutive months with a few other qualifying tests to firm it up because some people can have absent periods but have something else going on like PCOS or thyroid disorders but for someone with true menopause I do have patients like that who are coming in for some of them they are now starting their family building journey for others they're adding to their families and so we're talking a variety of options if it's someone who's perimenopausal I'm doing things like checking to see how many viable eggs they have what options do we have for biological and genetically related children for that person versus talking about the fact that even though you may have entered menopause and maybe no longer have viable eggs, you can still carry a pregnancy. And so we talk about those options. And, you know, like today I discharged a patient who is 51 years old, uh, pregnant with a a baby that is formed with a donor egg and her partner's sperm, um, but this is her child. And she has a few other embryos frozen. And certainly at my clinic, um, without any question, as long as you're meeting certain health criteria, you can carry your own pregnancy until age 58. So we see quite a variety at the clinic. And we, we'll talk about all those things today and the different tests we do and so forth. But we see a lot of patients like that. And then I have other patients who are former fertility patients who are now in menopause but wanting to continue their hormone management. I also see special cases of menopause. So these are patients who maybe had like a breast cancer diagnosis. And so they're very restricted in what sorts of hormone therapy they can do because of their hormone dependent um, breast cancer. And so we do very specific targeted strategies to address their symptoms without the use of hormones and things like that. 
Um, that's excellent. Thank you for that overview. And I, I realized I was remiss in not um, offering you each a moment to tell us a little bit more about your journey into this space. I sort of got excited and dive right into the, <laughs> the facts and what you see day to day um, on the ground. But but perhaps we can start with you, Omi Shade. What, what brought you into the space and, and what sustains you and inspires you about it? Um. Thank you. And thank you definitely for inviting me to be a part of this conversation with Dr. Duke. I, you know, it's my own lived experience. I'm, I'm 53 years old. Um, I had my first child at 25 and I had my, my last child at 41. Um, and I had a miscarriage at 40. And so much like you, you shared earlier in, in my bio, most of the work that I've done over the last 25 years has been in social justice work. And um, the last five to seven years has been with reproductive justice. And so I see reproductive justice as a spectrum, right? So it's like, you know, it doesn't begin with someone um, trying to make a decision around when or if they choose to have a child and under what conditions they have a child. It actually begins at birth because it's about your personhood. Um, it's about your bodily autonomy. It's about agency, right? And so, and it, it's a spectrum. It, it lasts your entire life. And so I'm really appreciating what Dr. Duke had to say too, because when you think about when you're thinking past this time of the decisions you're making around <clears throat> your family and what that looks like, you still are um, grappling with thinking about living with questions and realities around your body, right? And that also extends itself to pleasure. You know, a lot of times we talk about reproductive justice and we don't talk about sexual pleasure. Um, we don't talk about sexual expression. We talk about reproduction, right? And so I think if we're thinking about the fullest expression of who we are as people, whether we identify as a woman or a femme or a gender non-binary person, um, we get to think about, well, what does this look like for me? And I've been really lucky um, to be in a community of people who think about everything all the time, <laughs> all the time. And so my own personal journey always kind of matches up with the work that I have done in community, whether that's advocacy work or organizing or even some work that I've done in philanthropy. And so it's been very deeply personal, deeply personal. And that's how I ended up um, with the podcast. I decided that um, after about 23 years of work, I was like burnout and wanted to take a break. And I took a sabbatical last year. And while I was on sabbatical, I was trying to figure out two things. What was my relationship with rest, which was terrible. It's still iffy. I'm doing better. If I gave myself a letter grade, listen, if I gave myself a letter grade, y'all, and I'm being honest, it'd be about a C plus. I'm trying. I really am. But I also grew up um, watching the women in my family, watching the people in my family, and they never rested, right? They worked really, really hard all the time. You, re you rest when you're sick, right? Like when you're super feverish or ill. You don't rest because you feel like, I like to take a nap. They're like, a nap? There are things to do. You're like, so I had to figure out my relationship with rest. And I also wanted to, connect with other black women around our stories around aging. Like, how are you experiencing it? What's happening for you? What does joy look like? What does pleasure look like? What does intimacy look like? What does vulnerability look like? What does rage look like? Like, how are you tapping into all these things? Are you being creative? Are you being held? Are you being cared for? And let's talk about it, because I think that bearing witness to each other's stories is like a powerfully huge healing opportunity. It's, it's healing for me to tell my story. It's healing for me to have someone listen to my story earnestly and the vice versa. For me to actually hold space for someone to share their story with me, it just really kind of connects us up in ways that um, validates and respects our personhood, right? And so um, I definitely have a, a birth story that I, I, I tend to share with people um, as it relates to perimenopause, because Dr. Duke, you know, I was, when I popped up pregnant at 40, I was like, hmm, huh, what? <laughs> and, <laughs> and then to have that pregnancy end, um, 
that's a part of my journey as well. The story that I talk about with pregnancy loss. I mean, it was an anticipated pregnancy. And then the pregnancy ending just created a whole nother part of my identity and my story. So when we found ourselves, my ex-husband and I were pregnant again the next year, my mind was just in a place of like, well, what does this mean? Am I, am, am I gonna be able to carry this baby to term? Um, what does that look like? And I was really blessed to have a phenomenal OBGYN, phenomenal. And she had been my, my OB for 15 years. So she walked with me every step of the way. And I gave birth to a big, fat, juicy, eight pound boy. <laughs> with no issues um it was a really good I, my birth plan maybe was four pages long but i was a little hypersensitive <laughs> yeah <laughs> but I, I i appreciate us talking about this intersection because it is an intersection i was clearly perimenopausal um and have not had a cycle in seven years so i'm clearly menopausal postmenopausal. um i haven't had a cycle since 2013. Yay. And, <laughs> and it's, there is more than physicality. And I don't see aging or menopause as illness. I don't think that it serves us in this country to make it an illness. It is a, it is a physical experience mm -hmm. as anything else is. But I'm not sick because right. I'm aging. I'm not sick because I'm either menopausal or postmenopausal. I have needs. Yep. I have support that I require, but I'm not sick. Agreed. And I think us shifting that narrative is really important. Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, beautifully put, and thank you for sharing your story with us. And having seen some pictures of your son, he Aren't was an adorable baby and an adorable 12 year old. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, I think reflecting on that a little bit, it's, you're right, not an illness, but also for those women that do experience symptoms that affect their quality of life and are distressing to know that there are solutions out there and a variety of solutions that I'll let Dr. Duke talk about is something that we also don't talk about enough. Um, but you know, you just need to keep a lid on it and kind of grind through um, is, is a really important part of the conversation. So um, how about you, Dr. Duke? How did you come into this space? And, and also tell us a little bit about your um, background as a virologist. Yes, well, you know, so I grew up in the Caribbean. I was born in Trinidad and Tobago, all the way south of the Caribbean. And I grew up on the smaller island, Tobago, which at the time had a total population of about 25,000. Grew up in this village of, at most 50 households, at most. And what was interesting is people didn't, just like Omashade was saying, women just lived, right? And there wasn't discussion about periods. Certainly there were no discussions about menopause. Um, the most you knew was someone was older or you might just hear the word, the change. And the change seemed, it sounded ominous to me as a little girl, for sure. Because I imagine it was some dramatic event that happened at night and you woke up the next day and you'd been so transformed that you're now an old lady. And so that was sort of my view of menopause growing up in the Caribbean. And I moved to the United States and found myself as I moved from college to medical school and I was in an MD PhD program where I was working on both a medical degree and a doctor of philosophy and finding myself gravitating more and more to wood health, gravitating more and more to the messaging and the chemistry of womanhood and um, realizing, you know, when you look at the chemistry, um, it wasn't binary, it was the first thing I came across and started realizing, aha, these conversations are a little too, you know, they were packaged so that the conversation could be easy for a society, but there really is a spectrum. And as I started delving into it more with my biochemistry background, my virology background, so I did study human virology and vaccine development. And so I spent four and a half years in a lab creating different viral vectors and vaccine candidates, including some that have now made it all the way to stage two clinical trials. And, um, always asking myself, well, how do these two intersect? You know, as part of my work, I actually started looking at HIV and particularly how HIV fertility and then 
perimenopause was being addressed in sub-Saharan Africa. And the conversation that was happening amongst a very special group of women in certain parts of sub-Saharan Africa who are known as long-term non-responders when it comes to HIV in that they were infected, never had the disease progress, never required medications or anything, and have this robust immune system. And yet they tended to be women who were in a very unique stage of perimenopause. And there were a host of theories about the special immunity that they probably gained over the years of having carried a pregnancy and what type of pregnancy, even if you didn't deliver, might have also changed your immune system and how it responded. And so that was my initial interest. So then I got to residency and I did a lot of work on menopause with one of my mentors there at Johns Hopkins and started realizing the first thing that wasn't happening in everyday parlance, much like you said here today, Janine, is nobody talks about menopause. Now, we still need to do a better job talking about periods and fertility and when your period's normal versus painful. So we're not doing a great job there either. We certainly weren't telling women that despite everything, if you have an ovary, you're, you have a finite number of eggs you're born with, etc. But we really weren't explaining that menopause is very rarely an overnight event like I thought it was when I was a kid, right? It takes eight to 10 years for a lot of people, sometimes 12 years before that period finally ceases. And for many women, you're experiencing changes like your eyes, you know, we, we all hear that 40, you are gonna need new prescriptions and you have a special thing called presbyopia, with pres meaning old age, you know, so vision changes in old age, particularly in women. And when you delve into it, it's actually related to changes in your hormone and your hormone balances that's leading to changes in the muscles around your lenses in your eyes. And so your vision changes, your skin uh, quality changes, you know, sexual health changes. Um, doesn't mean you enjoy sex any less, but certain things need to be discussed about lubrication, etc. cetera. Um, and also re-educating partners, because for some people the thought is, oh, she's menopausal, perimenopausal, now I need to move on to another partner. You know, I can box her up, her, her time is done. And uh, that's not true. And so that's what brought me to the field. And I realized, of course, like I said, because we did such a great job in explaining to women that we can do everything that we forgot to talk about eggs aging. And as women in our generation, we look amazing. I mean, look at Omashade. She said 53 and I was like, no way, <laughs> impossible, right? Mm -hmm. And so, of course, imagine someone coming into my office feeling great, looking great, not looking their stated age, um, and finding out that, you know, their goals for childbearing may have to take a slightly different path. Um, it's never that we can't help help you achieve pregnancy but we may need to slightly change the ingredients for the pregnancy and having to explain oh actually you know this was a process that was happening progressively in your body i'm sorry no one ever made the connection to talk to you about that or egg freezing or about your painful periods being endometriosis and so forth where your fibroids play a role here and just to follow up on that question, because this comes up all the time where, you know, women often are very fond of their providers and yet it does seem like there's a bit of a breakdown. So, it, you know, in what ways do you think we could be better advocates to, I mean, it can be intimidating, you know, you have yes. seven minutes for an, an appointment. How do you um, recommend that women are better advocates for themselves with their providers, their existing providers or new providers? I'm a huge proponent of writing down your questions before you head in to see your provider, whether it be a physician, a nurse practitioner, PA, whomever you're seeing. I encourage people to write the questions down because the dynamics change despite even if you're the most vocal person, the most empowered person, you show up and the clinic's dynamics dictate the pace of the visit, you know? And so it's good to have those questions because what I tell my patients is, and you know, I've also been trained to literally ask my patients open-ended questions to give them an opportunity to fill in as many things as they'd like to. And I also end my visits 
by saying, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that I didn't cover with you today? Giving them that opening to say, oh yes, I have these things. But not everyone remembers all of those things. And you know, again, especially if you're going in for a well woman exam, which is that annual examination, there are all these anxieties already. What are they going to find? The dreaded speculum that can cause you to forget everything. You know, if you're somebody who maybe hasn't had the best experience at a gynecologist's office or a history of sexual assault, then that visit comes with its own sense of terror. And I say is yes you advocate for yourself the first thing you say is when they're doing your vital signs when you're checking in you know say can you tell doctor that I have some questions I'd love to cover with them today and if your doctor for one reason or another is saying well you know today we don't have enough time that's when you say well then can I schedule a follow-up to discuss these items with you because they are important to me and I think for too long women have felt that we are being dismissed at these visits and I say that as an OBGYN myself I've interacted with some providers where I was like well I didn't even get a chance to ask them how the exam went far more asking the things I wanted to talk about and so I know it's hard um, but I encourage advocating if you're someone who really doesn't feel comfortable talking to your provider bring a friend bring a friend so that their job is to remember you have these questions you know bring someone along um, but certainly if your provider is unwilling to listen to you if they're being dismissive then I think you should seek a second opinion I honestly think that you are at this point in your life people need to hear you <laughs> and if I'm willing to engage in that conversation then you you need someone who will listen I think that's excellent advice and, um, and we're going to actually capture those practical tips and share them out because it, it can sound, you know, yeah, sure, talk to your physician, take your questions, but actually writing them down, taking someone yes. to help you, mentioning it during the vitals, I think those are actually like really powerful and helpful to, you know, yes. make it happen in reality. <laughs> and, you know, like in my training, when I was trained, and certainly when I train my um, residents and fellows now, I also say, don't have those conversations while you're examining their pelvic carrier, right? She's just otherwise focused on other things. Now, you can talk to her about what's going on, but I don't know if Amashade thinks differently, but I don't encourage having her up in stirrups in that very vulnerable state. No, and at that same time, you're, you're trying to solve her biggest questions, you know? She's not going to remember. It's not fair to her to have that conversation then. Allow her to focus on the exam, her coping skills for the exam, if she has to do special breathing, etc. Inform her of what you're doing during the exam so she feels like she knows, you know? I do this one thing, which it's funny because some patients laugh, but I do it because of my own personal experience, which is many of us now, we use these plastic speculums that actually make a very loud clicking sound when you're opening it. And so I always say, you know, I'm about to use a speculum, cold jelly, little pressure. You'll also hear a few clicking sounds. Don't be alarmed. I promise you nothing's being broken or injured. And I literally came up with those words when I was an intern myself because I had gone to get a procedure and the person doing it, he told me before he started that it was one of his first exams he'd ever done. But all I kept hearing was click, 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 I'm sorry, click, 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 I'm sorry, click. And even though I was an OBGYN intern who knew what was happening down there that I was seeing, my brain started thinking, what's happening though? You know, because he's not making any progress at all hearing is the sounds and I'm sorry I'm sorry <laughs> so I say that to patients because even that reassures them that everything is okay and when they hear that sound if they're already somewhat apprehensive that could really startle them and they can pull up on the bed and it changes the dynamic so I like to prepare them and talk them through it thank you Omi Shade what are what are your thoughts in response to that um, here, here, and yes, yes, Dr. Duke. Uh, you know, as, as someone who's <laughs> who does advocacy work, I'm, I'm a big proponent of being prepared and recognizing that people have different experiences with doctors and um, and 
um, medical professionals. And so, you know, some folk are coming into the space um, with um, trauma, like she said, um, and that trauma is going to show up in a lot of different ways. And, you know, sometimes folk are not feeling like what they are saying will be believed or they can't find the words to be able to express exactly what it is they have a question about. And so being able to support people and thinking about if you were going to tell somebody about yourself, what would you want them to know? And the person who's going to be caring for you physically should know these things. Um, and it, because I, uh, I went through the experience of supporting my mom when she was transitioning from life, my mother had sarcoidosis for six years before she transitioned. And she passed away when I was 31. So I was pretty young. When I think about it now in retrospect, a lot of the things that she, and I was her health proxy. So a lot of things I had to figure out um, were because my mom was a nurse and because I was her health proxy. And so showing up at the hospital, going with her to doctor's appointments, um, being able to know the questions that she had, you know, if she had to have a breathing treatment because she was struggling to be able to say to a person, these are the medications that my mom is on. Please don't yell at my mom while she's doing this breathing treatment. All of her medications are in the bag. Let her finish the breathing treatment. We can talk about what she's experiencing right now. That kind of thing. That kind of prepared me in a lot of ways. And I was a young mom then. My son, my son was like six years old. So that experience of being my mom's advocate transitioned to me and was also bolstered by the work that I was doing in community. And I've also figured out, you know, um, in some of the trainings that we would do around reproductive justice, we would like speak to folk around how do you advocate for yourself in spaces? Um, how are people clear about your identity when you walk into a doctor's office? What pronouns are you, do you use? How do you want to be addressed? Um, if this is a, a well woman check, a well person check, like how do you establish a relationship with this provider? If there's something going on with you that you have concerns about, I think that writing things down is so key. And also I'm a, a full spectrum doula and I think my superpower is to slow the room down. Cause some, right? Because sometimes people are moving really, really fast in and out, gotta do their things, a lot of stuff going on. And it takes only a moment when you say to a person, what's your name again? Yes. And they go, oh. Like when you say that to someone, they realize, oh, you're gonna call me by my name. So if I said to Dr. Duke, what's your name again? And she said, oh, I'm Dr. Duke. I'd be like, great. So Dr. Duke. Yes. And, and that just, when you, when you say someone's name, and you look at them, they look right back at you and they go, I need to pay attention, this person is talking to me. Because things move fast. You know, it's the nature of our society, it's the nature of our culture. And certainly if you're, you know, if you whether you're going to a, a doctor's office or if you're at the hospital, things move fast. You can slow down. You actually can slow down. I did have an interesting experience with an OBGYN group because my, personal OBGYN was a part of a group. So there were like five doctors in the group, which meant you see all the doctors when you're pregnant. When I had my miscarriage, the doctor who was uh, available for me to see was not one of the doctors in the group that I was fond of. <laughs> and and it, it bore itself out in their response to me around experiencing this pregnancy loss. I had never had a miscarriage before. I didn't know what was happening to my body. I didn't know what to anticipate. I, I wanted to be sure that, are you sure that this is not gonna happen? Are you sure I'm gonna miscarry? And he was just so, his, his affect was flat. It was matter of fact, it was rust and it was quick. So I called my regular OBGYN when I got home and she said, come back in the morning. I will, I will meet you, I will meet you at the, at the office in the morning. And when I arrived at the office, she did everything again that he had done the day before, but with care and took her time. We talked when I got there, she examined me, we talked again and she confirmed that I was miscarrying. And she said, this is what you can expect. Because that was important. Yes. This is what you can expect. Um, because it was startling. You know, some people who have not miscarried or had pregnancy loss, you don't anticipate your body doing the things that it will do. 
and she was fantastic. So when I found out I was pregnant again, we did the same thing. We had these conversations every step of the way. She was like, what are your questions? And when I showed up with that three to four page birth plan, she wasn't surprised, you know, because I wanted yeah, to- I think she, So I've never been offended by someone having a birth plan. And I think if you have a birth plan, if you're someone who's pregnant and you show up and everybody's in their eggs and they aren't in favor of discussing your birth plan with you. I think that's a problem because it means that the shared responsibility isn't going to be there, right? Because they don't seem to understand that shared patient model, which is patient autonomy and, you know, being involved. Yes, I've gone to birth plans and said, okay, this part may not be very realistic in an emergent situation, etc. But if someone's telling you your birth plan or your care plan, because it doesn't necessarily have to be about birth, it may be how you want to be addressed at the office, how you wish to be identified at the office. Um, certainly, like Amashade is saying here, I personally do not think that the only time you meet your doctor is when you're already in the stirrups. They should come in and engage you first before asking you to undress. The act of undressing is a very vulnerable act and it should be happening after you've already met the person, felt comfortable, and know what's next. It shouldn't just be they walk in, you're already in stirrups, and you're barely seeing the top of their head from over the drain, you know? I think that's an excellent point. And actually, that um, there's a, a question and a comment in the chat, but before I go there, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Duke, um, and Omishade, I think it's fantastic that you have a provider that you like and trust, because so many women don't. and the also importance of having healthcare providers who reflect the diversity of the patients for whom they care and how difficult it can be to find those providers and so i know dr Duke, you have a list that you maintain can you tell us a little bit about that yes i actually created the directory of black women physicians and it's a directory of female physicians across the United States from all fields. And um, you can find it on my website at drcindyduke.com. It's under its own tab, um, the directory of black women physicians. But, you know, we know that representation matters. I think everyone who's on here has heard the phrase, representation matters. How that translates into healthcare for many people they're like well what does that mean exactly you know and one of the things i encountered along the years when i was training is many times i was one of a few black people within certain institutions and yet you'd always hear people say well we can't find them you know it's not and i'd ask well why aren't they included or why wasn't this person consulted you know but we know it matters cultural things matter um discussions about food, health, um, comfort level from the patient side of things, you know, for some patients from certain cultural backgrounds, menopause literally can mean not just a transition, oh, I may not be able to carry babies anymore, but in certain cultural and religious beliefs, it's also the opportunity for a second partner to be brought in to the marriage. And so there needs to be an understanding as opposed to judgment, you know, if you're your patient is very eager to find out, am I really in menopause and what does that mean for me? Um, if you have someone who knows that they've already always had a very clear link between their hormonal status and the fluctuations in their hormones and their mood, you know, you may have someone who's very high functioning, CEO, et cetera, et cetera. But if her hormones are imbalanced, she may be having trouble sleeping, which then means her mood isn't really what it used to be when she's at work or she may not be as lucid and clear in terms of, you know, let's say we're dealing with a pilot. You know, I have one of my patients, she's a pilot, and it's a big deal that her hormones, that she feels like she has the mental clarity that she needs at all times. And so things like that, it's important to understand who you're dealing with. And for some patients, literally it takes someone from within their cultural scope to understand their unique specific issue and you know part of pe feeling comfortable in your healthcare is feeling comfortable with who's caring for you and feeling like you have choice and that's important that's important 
thank you. I think that, that was very well put. Um, so the question in the chat, and feel free um, folks to add questions or to take yourself off mute, um, is Dr. Duke, did your practice or approach change after you experienced perimenopause personally? You know, I think I had a very enlightened practice before. I would tell you the first thing I did was I called my mom because I realized my mom made menopause transition look like it didn't happen for her. <laughs> you know, so I remember calling her up and saying, um, how can you never mention these things? You know, like the fact that I was waking up four times at night as opposed to just sleeping through the night despite being tired or finding myself the vision changes, you know, I even considered getting a head scan because I had to change my prescription three times in one year and saying, I had to remind myself, Cindy, this is because of what's going on, you know? Um, so how did it change? I, I think in some ways now I can describe what a hot flash feels like. I can describe what that energy level change feels like, you know, um, I recognize when it, when it started that, you know, being the person, an OBGYN who, God forbid, was trained Omashade to go 30 plus hours without sleep. And so you stop valuing rest and sleep. And one of the things I had to do over the past year as well was change my relationship to sleep and really delve into my sleep hygiene and make a promise to myself that I needed sleep because I started realizing that whereas in my 20s and 30s, if I only slept two hours, I could still go 30 hours the next day and not feel it or at least convince myself <laughs> that I wasn't feeling it. Whereas now if that happens, I feel it. I feel myself fading, you know? And so um, I, th I think those are some of the things that it's more a personal, understanding of what I've been talking about all these years, I now get to say, oh, this is what that feels like. So this is actually a, a topic that we wanted to double click on. So can you tell us a little bit more about hormones and what's happening in perimenopause and what you mentioned uh, around testing and tracking? So especially as women are still thinking about options around pregnancy as they reach their 40s. Well, I would say, you know, if you're someone who historically had regular periods, it means your body is undergoing a very regular conversation that usually starts in your pituitary gland, which is your hormone center in the brain. And it's supposed to be talking to your ovaries every month to tell it, it's sort of or coordinating an orchestra that ultimately leads to the release of an egg, ovulation. And then if you're not pregnant, a period, because 14 days post ovulation, if there isn't an implantation, your lining of the uterus sheds, hence the period, and the orchestra starts again. As we age, our egg number, so when we're born, we're born with a very fixed number of eggs. We don't make new eggs. And as we age, that number of eggs declines. The quality of the eggs declines somewhat as well. And when we say quality, we mean the reproductive potential of an egg. And so, for example, you know, when your egg is 25 years old, the chance that that egg would yield a live born baby is about seven to eight times higher than the, uh, the chance of that very egg when it's now 42, 43, 44, yielding a live born baby. An emphasis on live born, because much like Omashadi has described, as a woman ages, her risk of miscarriage does increase. And that has to do with the egg's ability to you know, compartmentalize and sort chromosomes or genetic material. Um, so that's the conversation that's typically happening from the moment you've entered puberty. Actually, it starts a couple years before first period until perimenopause. Now, as your body is going through its aging process, the number of eggs that it has to select from decreases. And so it's almost like shuffling through a deck of cards and the shuffle gets faster, right? It's shuffling faster because it's seeking a better egg so to speak. And so what's very common is one of the things that many women see, periods start changing and 
get more frequent. Some women see it spacing out, but at first, actually, it gets more frequent. So you maybe know that instead of a 28 day cycle, your periods are now every 21 days or something like that. And that's because the time following ovulation to period shortens all the luteal phase. Um, suddenly a, a heat cloud enveloped you and you're like what happened to me you know some of us would just get you see sweat and that's the flush right your skin color changes and you feel damn um, same thing happens you're in bed and what can happen particularly with patients who have partners is it's the yo-yo effect at night you know one moment you're very hot and so you want the AC at max in winter time and then an hour or two later you're laying there shivering <laughs> because the heat wave has passed and so you'll notice things like that but others it's changes in sleep pattern you know your sleep cycle shortens and so you're waking up more frequently your mood might change um, for some of us our mood is really connected to estrogen which is the hormone that ovary makes as it's preparing an egg for ovulation your estrogen level goes up and so it's very they're sort of you know, spiking and going that way they also feel their mood getting a little bit more what we call labile or mood ability and so you know we talk about cognitive behavioral therapy to help with mood we talk about sometimes low doses of hormones um, if someone is mostly only having hot flashes we have medications that are hormone free to help hot flashes they're herbal medicines but i'm also a huge proponent for complementary therapy so yoga acupuncture, acupuncture, um, learning those different things, mindfulness exercises to start preparing for that transition as well. That just a quick follow-up to that because you mentioned you know the, the wild swings in hormones and we understand that many physicians don't do or don't recommend testing hormones but because they can be changing between you know 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. but what is your thought on that? When does it make sense to use hormone testing to better based on symptoms honestly you know i think we the, the service we do to a lot of our patients is telling them you have to fit into this box right and that's the service because yes for some people lower estrogen levels and they don't feel a thing you know like i asked my mom did you have these hot things and she's like maybe i don't remember it didn't bother me you know um, but for someone else you know let's say you're someone who has to be in important meetings etc hot flashes all that can, that can really disrupt your meeting can disrupt your business if you're a surgeon and suddenly you're in the middle of surgery and sweat is just dripping from you that can impair what you're doing including your sterile field you know and so it's really important to treat symptoms and not just say well you don't meet my definition Right? Um, certainly with some people, again, it's hormonal shift. So maybe you're not yet in menopause, but your thyroid is trying to figure out what's going on with the changes in the hormones it's seeing. And so now your thyroid isn't functioning as it should. We need to address that. You know, perhaps your adrenals aren't functioning as they should. So your libido and otherwise are also changing. We may need to address that. Um, some women, the estrogen levels are so uniquely tied to their bone health that they may start seeing signs of osteoporosis and osteopenia earlier than what we typically tell people you'd see. So no, I don't use a broad brush to paint. I don't dismiss symptoms. Um, some people can go through menopause. And, it's important to say this, right? Your friend's menopause journey may be different from yours. It doesn't make you weird. It doesn't make you dramatic. It doesn't make you overly sensitive. 
each person's hormonal milieu is different and what your body responds to is different. Especially if you're trying to conceive. Someone should be looking at that. I think that um, is something that resonates a lot. We have heard from women in our community and Omishade, I'm curious what you hear, that sometimes they don't feel comfortable talking with their friends because someone is clearly having a much harder time and it's much more visible than maybe the libido or the painful sex that you're not as willing to talk about, even if you were, you know, sort of sisters in arms during pregnancy, that when it comes to perimenopause and menopause, it can be quite a different and more isolating journey. Um, and then I have a couple of great questions that I want to turn to, but um, what, do, what do you hear, Amishade? Um, I hear a diversity of responses to that. Um, I hear some um, folks say that the conversations that they have when they're perimenopausal or menopausal go deeper. Um, that there is um, something that is brought to the conversation with more lived experience that's deep, right? And so it, it really depends on the person. I think that, you know, each person has their, their own journey and walk with their body. Um, what they observed. I really appreciated Dr. Duke saying that, I, you know, I talked to my mom. I did the same thing. My my elder sisters, um, I have sisters who are 16 and 20 years older than me. So when my pubic hair started going gray, sorry y'all, because it, it will. I was like, this is a thing. And I was offended and I caught my eldest sister and I was like, who has gray hair? I said, you couldn't tell me that this was gonna happen? And she was like, I mean, I figured you would ask if you wanted to know. And I was like, okay. So I just think that there are invitations to conversation if you take it. And there may not be conversations you have with your entire social circle, but with your direct intimates. And that's what I have found. It's like, you know, there are many people that I'm very social with, but when I started my perimenopausal journey, the people who I always returned to were my intimates. And that was a small group of folk that included like two first cousins and then three girlfriends who I've been friends with since I was like 12. And we, as a collective of about five or six people, were always doing these deep dives with each other around, is this happening to you? Is this happening to you? How are you feeling about this? I feel like something's up. I'm like not quite sure. And so that was the, the physical parts, but we were also having really, really deep and earnest conversations about how we were feeling emotionally and mentally and spiritually, in fact. And so what I have found recently with the podcast and the interviews that I've done, the oldest person I interviewed was in her 90s. Uh, the youngest person I interviewed was my peer. They were 53, 52, 53. Is that everybody has a story to tell. Um, and everybody's experiencing different things differently that are very unique to their own lived experiences. And they want to talk about it in a, in a place that feels safe, you know? So it, it, the, creating a space of, of safety, creating a space where here's something with me, you know, that it's going to be respected and affirmed, right? Even if it's different, yes. um, even if it's not what I'm experiencing, I, I, in particular, someone who identifies as a cis hetero woman, um, the conversations that I've had with my queer friends, um, my trans friends, my friends who are gender non-binary, and for me to hold that space, knowing that my ability to move in the world um, as a person who feels free and safe from harm is completely connected to their experience. And if they're not free, I'm not free. So, it's been really powerful to see that. And I also think, Janine, that you did you did touch on something that people were yearning for. Um, some people do experience this in isolation. Some people do. Some people feel like I'm going insane and no one's noticing it. And I am I'm being rendered invisible on the job as one of the older people on the job or someone who's been on the job the long and no one is noticing it or things are shifting in my home and no one's noticing it and so that creating intentional space for folks to say I see you actually I do see you I do 
do that beautifully. And, and you're actually both podcast hosts. So we'll send those links out. And it's very clear in the way that you speak and how articulate and eloquent you are that um, you're both very good at having and creating safe spaces for these types of conversations. And it's something that we're philosophically aligned with because it's not simply a physiological or an emotional transition. It's about identity and who we are in the world and who we want to be because we want to be. I don't know if folk watched Lovecraft Country. I hope you did. If you did not, it's on HBO. You can watch it now. You can binge watch it over the holidays. Enjoy. It is <laughs> it is scary. It is gory. It is amazing. And one of the episodes, um, Anjanu Ellis's character, whose name was Hippolyta, was clearly either mer- perimenopausal or menopausal. She's going through it. She's having a yes. she's going through it. She gets to choose. She's invited by some intergalactic sentient being to choose where she wants to be and who she wants to be. And I actually feel like menopause and perimenopause are portals to new iterations of yourself, right? Like, I'm going to keep growing. I'm going to keep evolving. I'm going to keep learning about myself. And this, this physical moment that I find myself in, whether it's perimenopause or menopause, is a portal to a whole new iteration. So my guy, the last time I had a conversation with my gynecologist, they wanted to know, well, what's going on with your, va- your vaginal dryness? I'm like, I, I'm not experiencing that currently. And they were like, oh, you're not? I'm like, no. They were like, are you sure? I'm like, I'm pretty sure. And they were like, if you do, we have something for you. I'm like, good to know not my journey right in this moment but if i find myself in that space requiring some additional assistance because i do want to continue to explore my own passion my own pleasure my own intimacy and if that becomes a barrier to that good looking out i want you to help me figure that out and 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 my doctors know me now they're like sure you got any questions i'm like i'm good i don't have any questions around that yet i hope that doesn't become this this is something so you already touched on this but i I do want to also give dr duke the opportunity so what are some of the benefits um because we always talk about you know the dark and gloomy and the end of fertility and visibility so what can we look forward to and what can we celebrate here i mean i one of the things that's always amazed me is patients say that sex is so guilt-free and i think it's because for so many people with ovaries and vaginas when they're having sex the big fear is oops i can't get pregnant here especially if you're not trying to conceive at the time so that's one freedom you of course have to be mindful that you can still contract sexually transmitted infections so you need to be mindful of that and be mindful of it with your partners but there is that certain level of freedom that comes with it there's also an empowerment that comes with it because you've been there you've done that you know it right you can have the conversations you can teach the younger ones but you can also help empower your friends you can travel without ever having to worry about locating period supplies and packing them into bags and all that stuff. There's something pretty liberating about that, you know, and I think many of us don't hear about that part. Um, Many of us also were at a stage where financially things are looking up. You're in more control. You understand your finances more. And so I have so many patients and friends of mine who've embarked on entirely different life journeys, career journeys at the time of their menopausal transition or during perimenopause. And speak of my own mom, you know, we migrated to the United States. Again, that didn't hit me until I turned 40 when I realized my mom left a whole world and started a new life in the United States at 40, right? And at the time, I didn't think of it because, you know, I was 18 and in my feelings about having to start a new world, it never dawned on me that this woman at 40 had moved from an entirely different world where she had businesses, etc., and moved here to facilitate my dream and ultimately my brother's. But it didn't dawn on, on me until it happened for me. And I was like, wait a minute. But it, it gave me an empowerment because I realized you can do anything. You know, think of your mom. And we've been in this country for over 26 years and she's still going, still doing new things, you know. Um, like Amashadi said about the gray hair. Again, I call my mom. I 
I was like, you never told me this could happen. And my mom, a typical Caribbean woman thing, she did this thing with her mouth. We called it strips and she was like, you don't like it, shave it. Why are you calling me? You know, she was like, just shave it off. If you don't want to see it, get rid of it, right? She was not in the mood for me going on about how nobody told me that this was gonna happen so early, which was in my 30s, you know, or that the hair under your armpit. The first time I saw a gray hair under my armpit, that freaked me out because I thought it was deodorant. So I kept wiping and I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> then my brain said, Cindy, it's a gray hair. It's a gray hair. <laughs> 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 and you know that's the other thing though like Omashade was saying having that core group of people you can commiserate with including jokes because you you start joking about the things that shock you about menopause that you knew would happen because i'm an ecologist i've seen gray hair down there i just never figured i was that person mm -hmm. you know there's we that have, we have a running, group, running joke in our women's group about charlie horses because um, yes. we catch a Charlie horse all the time. I catch Charlie horse yes. in my. We said, but what if you catch a Charlie horse while you're trying to have sex? Like, what do you? Yes. So the running running joke is to keep mustard beside the side of your bed because mustard is a homeopathic <laughs> remedy for yes. Charlie horses. You just eat a spoonful. Know that. <laughs> yeah, be a spoonful, and it'll help work that out. And he's like, but so that's the running joke around sex after fifty. He's like. What is the what are the sexual accoutrements that you need? You need a profile. You need a condom. <laughs> you need lube and you need yes. mustard. Yes. Uh, yes. You take that, you know, take, that, mustard take that and spread it around the world and share that with the information. I like that. And it works. It works. It works. <laughs> it is um it is five oh two and I have one question that we didn't get to if you both don't mind. We'll take thirty seconds. Um and it's for Dr. Duke. It's did you find in your early uh, studies that there is a boost to women's immune system during perimenopause? Yeah, so, you know, what we noticed is menopause, your immune system takes on a different profile, but it's not weakened. And I think it's important because there was, for about 25 years, a lot of misinformation that said things like, oh, pregnant women are immunocompromised. And there was also this belief that menopause rendered you immunocompromised, which is not true. And so, yes, there are different health states that can change your immune system. So if you have underlying diabetes or autoimmune things like Omashadi's mom, sarcoidosis, etc., that can change how your immune system works but the act of menopause in and of itself doesn't make you immune system weak um, it's certainly certain antibodies and so forth wait if you were vaccinated when you were a child to something it's now been four decades to your last vaccination your immune memory may change for that thing or if maybe you had chicken pox as a two three year old and never again exposed to it then even though it's the same virus that causes chicken pox and shingles your immune memory may not be the same such that you could develop shingles now because your cells that were primed since you were two or three years old no longer remember what chicken looks like because it's long since they've seen it and so that's what we talk about when we say the immune system changes is memory you know just as how your actual memory and your brain function wanes and some things you remember very clearly other things it's like that's another thing that happened i was like huh i have to think a little harder about certain things now to recall i make notes to myself so that i remember those things whereas before my dayminder was in my head. I never kept checklists, never kept <laughs> dayminders. Well, the immune system is the same thing. And so it remembers certain things more rapidly because it's been exposed to them more frequently or more recently, while others are not. Thank you so much. I, I'm so grateful. Team Electra is so grateful you brought both incredible um, information, stories, science, and we had a great laugh. So I don't know about you guys, but that's a great way to round out <laughs> Wednesday in December. Um, so thank you very much. And to everybody 
um, who joined, we will send links and follow up and um, Electra is here to help you answer any questions and get you the information and care that you need to thrive in this phase and beyond. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you. you. So good to be here. Thank you.